Peace of Gaul. Chapter Ten of the Battle which the Child of the Sea had with King Abies, and how he conquered him, whereby the war between King Abies and King Perion was concluded. But they on both sides, seeing that the greater part of the day was spent, determined that the combat should be delayed till the morning, albeit against the will of both champions. And this also they did, that their arms might be repaired, and some remedy applied to their wounds. And because both armies being wearied, and having been hardly handled, stood in need of rest. The child of the sea therefore entered the town with Agriez and King Perion, and as he rode along with his head unarmed, the people cried out, Ah, good knight, God give thee grace to proceed as thou hast begun. Thou art a fair knight, and one upon whom knighthood was well bestowed. As they drew nigh the palace, a damsel met with them, and said to the child of the sea, that the queen desired he would not be disarmed anywhere but in her apartments. This was at the king's desire, who now said, Friend, you must needs grant this request, and Agrias must bear you company. So they went thither, where they found the queen and her many ladies and damsels ready to disarm them. But the queen would suffer none of them to touch the child of the sea, whom she herself disarmed, and threw a mantle over him. The king then came and saw how he was wounded, and asked him why he had not delayed the day of the battle. "'It had been needless,' quoth the child. "'I have no wound to detain me.' So they presently dressed his wounds, and the supper was brought. On the morrow the queen and her ladies went to visit them, and they found them conversing with the king. Then mass was said, which being ended the child armed himself, not in the arms which he had worn yesterday, for they had been so dealt with that they were useless, but in a rich and goodly armor. Then he took leave of the queen and mounted a fresh horse. King Perion carried his helm, and an old knight called Agonon his lance, and Prince Agrias his shield, whereupon were portrayed two azure lions in a field of gold, rampant the one against the other. They went out from the town and found King Abias mounted on a large black courser, armed at all points save his head. The townsmen and those of the host placed themselves where they might best see the combat. The lists were marked out, and scaffolding erected round them. Then they laced on their helmets. King Abies hung round his neck a shield, which bore a giant in a field of azure, and a knight beheading him, for so he had once slain a giant who had lain waste his country. When they both had taken their arms, all who were in the lists went out, each commending their own champion to God, and the two knights ran at each other as they who were of great strength and good heart. At the first encounter all their arms failed, the lances pierced through the shield and the breastplate, and into the flesh, and the staves flew in pieces, and they met body to body and horse to horse so furiously that they both fell, and all the beholders thought them dead. But soon they rose and plucked the spearheads from the wound, and engaged so fiercely with their swords that it was fearful to see them. Yet the combat seemed unequal, not that the child of the sea was not well made and of goodly stature, but King Abies was so large that there was no knight whom he did not exceed in stature by a palm, and his limbs were like those of a giant. He was, however, beloved by his people, and had in him all good qualities except that he was too proud. The battle between them was cruel and without any respite, and their strokes resounded like the fight of twenty knights. They sliced away the shields, and battered the helmets, and hewed away the harness, and each bled so fast, that it was a wonder how they could endure. And thus they continued till the hour of terce. And then the sun grew hot and heated their armor, so that they began to wax somewhat feeble. At this time King Yabiez drew back. Hold, said he, and let us rest if you will. Thou art the best knight that ever I have combated withal but I shall not for that spare thee, for thou hast killed him whom I loved best, and now puttest me to shame that the battle should last so long before so many good men. The child of the sea answered him, King Abies, thou hast shame for this, and not for entering this country in thy pride, and doing so much evil to him who had not deserved it at thy hands. Remember that men, and kings especially, are not to do what they can, but what they ought. And now thou wishest to rest? So have they whom you in your oppression would not allow to rest. And that you may feel what you have made others feel, 
look to yourself, for you shall not rest here. Abies then took his sword, and the little of his shield that was left. To thy own misfortune dost thou brave me, quoth he, for thou shalt not leave these lists till I have cut off thy head. Do thy utmost, replied the child. Herewith more cruelty than before they renewed the battle, as if it were even then begun. King Abies, who was well practised in arms, fought warily now, warding the sword at his antagonist, and striking where the blow could injure most. But the lightness and promptitude of the child made him in the end lose ground. And now has the child destroyed all the remaining part of his shield, and wounded him so often that the sword turned in his hand for weakness, and so pressed he was that he gave back and almost turned to fly, seeking some safety against that sword that so cruelly he felt. But when he saw no remedy but death, he grasped his sword in both hands and smote at the child, thinking to hew his helmet. The shield caught the blow, and the sword pierced in so deep that Abies could not pull it forth. The child, in return, struck him so fiercely on the left leg that he cut it off, and the king fell. The child set foot upon him, and plucking off his helmet, said, Thou art dead, King Abies, if thou dost not yield thyself vanquished. He replied, I am indeed dead, not vanquished, and my pride has overthrown me. I pray thee, let assurance be given to my people, that they may safely depart and carry me into my own country. I forgive thee and all whom I hated, and all that I have taken from King Perion shall be restored. And I beseech you, let me be confessed. When the child of the sea heard this, he was exceedingly sorrowful for King Abies, though he knew that he would have been without pity had he been the conqueror. And now the men of the army and of the town assembled in peace. King Abies ordered all his conquests to be restored, and Perion gave assurance to the Irish that they might return in safety. And Abies, having received all the sacraments of the Holy Church, gave up the ghost, and they carried him to his own country, making great lamentation for his loss. King Perion and Agriez and the chiefs of the realm then came to the child and led him away from the field with such honors as the conquerors in these feats are wont to receive, who by their prowess procure not only glory to themselves, but the welfare of a ruined country. The damsel of Denmark had arrived at the commencement of the battle, and now, seeing how happily it had ended, she came up to him. Child of the sea, speak with me apart. He went aside with her, and then she said, Oriani, your mistress, hath sent me, and I bring you from her this writing, wherein you shall find your name. He took the writing, but he had heard nothing save the name of his lady, and that had so confused him that the writing fell from his hand, and he dropped the reins upon his horse's neck. What now, sir? quoth she. Take you so ill the message that comes from the noblest damsel in the world, and who so dearly loveth you, and hath made me endure so much toil in your search? Friend, said he, I did not hear what you said for this pain which seized me, as you once witnessed heretofore. She answered, You need not dissemble with me. I know both your affairs and my lady's, for she hath trusted me, and if you love her you do no wrong, for it is not easy to relate how dearly she loveth you. And with that she repeated Oriana's message, and gave him again the writing, which he opened and saw that his name was Amadis. The damsel, having accomplished her errand, would then have returned, but he besought her to remain till the third day, and then he would accompany her. I came to you, she replied, and shall do as you command. The child then rejoined King Perion, who was awaiting him. As they entered the city, the people welcomed with shouts their deliverer. So they proceeded to the palace, and in the child's chamber they found the queen and all her ladies, and they took him in their arms from his horse, and the queen disarmed him, and masters came and searched his wounds, which, though many, were without danger. The king desired that he and Agrias would eat with him, but he would have no other company than the damsel, to whom he did all the honor that could be devised. Thus he remained some days, nor did his wounds prevent him from walking frequently in the great hall to converse with the damsel, whom he still detained till he could bear arms and accompany her. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11. How King Perion and Queen Elisena knew the child of the sea to be their son, Amadis. It so happened that as he was one day walking in the hall with the damsel young Militia, King Perion's daughter, 
passed by him weeping. He asked her why she wept, and she told him for a ring which her father had given her to keep while he slept, and which she had lost. "'I will give you another as good,' said the child, and he gave her one from his finger. She looked at it and cried, "'This is the one I lost. Then it is the one in the world most like it. So much the better. You may give it for the other.' And leaving her, he went with the damsel to his chamber, and laid upon his bed, and she upon another that was there. The king awoke and asked his daughter for the ring. Then she gave him the same she had of the prince, which he put on, thinking it was his own. But presently he saw his own lying where Melicia had dropped it, and taking it up he compared it with the other, which he then saw was the one which he had given to Elisena, and which she told him, when he had inquired for it, had been lost. He demanded of the little girl how she came by that ring, and she, who was much afraid of him, told him what had happened. Immediately he began to suspect the queen that she had fallen into some dishonest liking of the young knight for his great worth and exceeding beauty. And he took his sword and went into the queen's chamber and fastened the door. Madam, said he, you always denied to me the ring which I gave you, and the child of the sea has now given it to Melicia. How came he by it? If you tell me a lie, your head shall pay for it. Ah, God, mercy! quoth Elisena, and fell at his feet. I will tell you what I have hitherto concealed, but now you suspect me. And then she told him how she had exposed the infant, with whom the ring and the sword were placed. And then she lamented and beat her face. Holy Mary, cried the king, I believe that this is our child. The queen stretched out her hands. May it please God. With that they went into his chamber, whom they found sleeping, but Elisena wept bitterly because of her husband's suspicion. The king took the child's sword, which was at the bed's head, and looking at it he knew it well, and as one wherewith he had given many and hard blows, and he said to Elisena, By my God, I know the sword. Then Elisena took the child by the arm and wakened him, who awoke in wonder and asked her why she wept. Ah, said she, whose son art thou? So help me, God, I know not, for by great hap I was found in the sea. The queen fell at his feet, hearing him, and he cried, My God, what is all this? My son, quoth she, you see your parents. When the first joy had a little subsided, he remembered the writing and took it from his bosom. Elisena saw it was what Darioletta had written. Ah, my son, quoth she, when last I saw this writing, I was in all trouble and anguish, and now I am in all happiness. Blessed be God. It were long to tell what joy Agrias made in the lords of the realm at this discovery. The damsel of Denmark could now no longer abide. Sir Amadis, said she, I will go carry these good tidings to my lady, for you must tarry to give joy and gladness to those eyes that have shed so many tears for your sake. God have you in his keeping, replied Amadis, I shall soon follow. It will come in arms like those I wore against King Abies, so shall ye know me. At this time would King Agrias also depart, for the damsel, when she brought him Galapano's helmet, came with a message from his mistress, Olinda, daughter, to King Vanyan of Norway, desiring to see him with all convenient speed. He had won her love when he was with Galvanes in that kingdom. Now Galvanes was his uncle, and because he had only one poor castle to his heritage, they called him Lackland. Cousin, said Agrias, I desire your company above all other things, but I must now go where my heart leads me. Where shall I find you on my return? In the house of King Lisuave, said Amadis, for there they tell me is chivalry more worthily maintained than in the house of any other king or emperor in the world, and I pray you commend me to your parents, for they as well as you may ever sustain me in their service for the education they gave me. This said, Agrias took leave of the queen his aunt, and departed with his company. The king and Amadis conducted him through the city. As they were going out of the city gate, they met a damsel who took Perion's bridle and said to him, King Perion, remember what thou wert told, how when thou didst recover thy loss, the kingdom of Ireland shall lose its flower. See now if the damsel told thee true, for thou hast found thy son who was lost, and that brave King Abies is slain, who was the flower of Ireland. And now I tell thee, that never shall that country have his like till the good brother of the lady shall come, who shall proudly and violently make the tribute of other lands be brought there, and he shall die by the hands of him 
who must perish for the thing in the world that he loves best. This was Mahos of Ireland, brother to the queen, whom Sir Tristan de Alaines slew on the quarrel of tribute demanded from King Mark of Cornwall, and Tristram himself was slain afterward, because of Queen Isolde, who was the thing in the world that he loved best. And this, said the damsel, my mistress Odegana sends me to tell thee. Then, said Amadis, damsel and my friend, say to her whom sent you that the knight to whom she gave the lance commendeth himself to her good grace, being now assured in the matter whereof then she spake, that with that lance I should deliver from death the house from whence I sprung, for I saved with it the king my father. So the damsel returned, and Agriez went his way. Then King Perion summoned to Cortes, that all might see his son Amadis. And then were great rejoicings and pastimes made in honor of the Lord whom God had given them. And many things were done in that Cortes, and many and great gifts did the king bestow. And when Amadis heard how the giant had carried away his brother Galior, he determined to seek him and recover him by force of arms or otherwise. When the Cortes was ended, he requested his father permission to go to Great Britain. Much did the king and queen labor to detain him, but it might not be, by reason of the love he bare, which made him obedient to none but his lady. So he clad himself in armor like that which Abias had destroyed in the combat, and taking none with him but Gandaline, set forth. They proceeded till they came to the sea, then entered a vessel, and sailed to a goodly city in Great Britain, which is called Bristol. Here he learned that King Lisuarte was at his town of Windsor, whither he shaped his course. But far had he not gone when he met a damsel, who demanded of him if that were her ready way to Bristol, and if she could find shipping there for her speedy passage into Gaul. "'Whom seek you there?' said he. "'The good knight Amadis, who was the king's son, and has not long known his father.' Greatly did Amadis marvel thereat. And he asked her from whom she had heard thereof. I know it, quoth she, from her to whom nothing is hidden, from Uhudaganda the unknown, who now stands in such need of him, that by no other can she obtain what she desires. Thanks to God, said Amadis, she who can assist all now requires me to assist her. Let us go, for I am the man whom you seek. And he forsook his road and followed her. End of chapter 11